Today on Quest, linguist Julianne Balata. Life is a quest for logic and reason. It is a quest to find balance between science and faith. Life is a quest for knowledge and understanding. But most importantly, it's a quest for personal discovery. Whatever your quest, knowing yourself is the beginning of all wisdom. Welcome to Quest. Hello everyone, I'm your host, Todd Fisher, and this is Quest. For those of you that might be new listeners, let me tell you a little about me. I'm the founder of Metatomics and the author of the best-selling book, Metatomics, The Grand Design. I'm a philosopher, a theorist, a metaphysicist. I'm a perpetual pupil of theology, and I'm an expert in comparative religious study. I've also extensively researched the mind-body connection, anatomy, and physiology. I documented over 300 case studies while researching my book, all from a scientific perspective, with cases that range from near-death and out-of-body experiences to possession to past life experiences, as well as the metaphysical, the paranormal, and other unexplained cases of a spiritual nature. This podcast will bring you some of those astonishing stories, and in some cases by the people that actually lived them. From time to time, I'll be talking about important, perhaps even controversial issues from both spiritual and scientific points of view. The world we live in is ever-changing, and there's often a conflict between spirituality and science, And I wanted to bring you this podcast to balance that equation. It will show you how we know what we know. And there's still so much we don't know. For me, curiosity is part of what makes us human. It's the joy of discovery. It's what drives us. It's our quest. Welcome to Quest. You know, it's interesting from week to week, you hear me talk for 45 minutes to an hour, sometimes a little longer, all words. That's all you get. Todd and his spoken words. Well, today, this podcast is literally about words. Joining me today is linguist Julianne Balata, and we break down everything you'd ever want to know about language and words and particularly the power of words. I really like today's podcast. I hope you enjoy. Here it is. Hi, Julianne. Welcome to the Quest Podcast. Hi, thank you for having me. So I'm excited for today's interview. I find language very fascinating. And um, I always, in my youth, excelled in foreign languages. And when I I found you on TikTok doing these cool little videos, I was like, this is a guest right here. I've got to reach out to to Julianne and and see if she'll come on and and tell me everything I want to know about language and linguistics and all the variations of speak. And uh, I want to really get into your head about this. So welcome to the show. And thank you. I'm so so glad you like my TikToks. (laughs) (laughs) They're great. It was, it's so unique too. Like, Obviously, there's a certain type of TikTok video that's prevalent out there, and you weren't dancing or doing anything corny like that. <laughs> no, you don't want me to do that, first of all. Um, <laughs> but, you know, I, I have a colleague who had started making an educational TikTok about her work, and I loved it. And I thought this is so great in terms of kind of bringing academic knowledge to people who might otherwise not have access to it. And that is one of the one of my kind of main goals in the work that I do. So I love that I was able to do it, but it is challenging because I'm a talker. And so getting that information into 60 seconds has <laughs> been a different kind of challenge. <laughs> right. Well, we have 45 minutes to an hour today, so we could get right. into more. Tell, so tell our listeners a little about you and your education and what exactly a linguist is. So I did not originally start as a linguist. My undergraduate degree is in anthropology and history um, because I've always been very much um, 
I've always very much loved history. But once I graduated, I took two years off. And one of the things that I did was um, travel to London as the liaison for a study abroad program with my college. And while I was there, I started learning um, Arabic just for fun because I, at the time my partner was um, learning Arabic in the military. And because I am competitive, I wanted to see if I could learn it better than them. <laughs> uh -huh. um, so once I started doing that, I started making connections between the area I was living in, in London and language. And I started making connections to education in general. Um, and so when I went to graduate school, I was in a linguistic anthropology program and did my field work on, um, I did my field work on Arabic ESL students in New Jersey. And after that experience, I realized that I wanted to do more in terms of, um, I didn't want to just get my field work done and then become, um, and then just not do anything with it. Um, so I wanted to make changes at a policy level. So that's why I applied to a PhD program in language education. Um, and so that's kind of how I got to where I am now. My work currently is not very relevant to the work that I started doing originally. Now I work on the seal of biliteracy in New Jersey, which is um, students are able to get recognition on their, their de degrees for taking another language course in school or being bilingual. And so I do equity work on that when it comes to emergent bilingual students. Um, so that's where I am now. And in terms of being a linguist, do you want me to just define different types of linguists that there are? Yeah, absolutely. So there's, I mean, there's different kinds of linguists. And if, if a linguist that I don't mention hears this, they're for sure going to come for me. But generally, I, the way that I think of linguistics is that there is formal linguistics and then there's sociolinguistics. So formal linguistics is looking at form, structure, and use of language, while sociolinguistics and linguistic anthropology, anthropology are looking at like the lived life of language and how, what language does in the world. And so while I do have training in formal linguists, uh, formal linguistics, I, I'm much more um, focused on the social life of language, what language does in the world, um, how it impacts people, how it impacts culture, how it impacts society in general. Um, so that is my very cut and dry, two different types of linguists. And then there are historical linguists as well that uh, study kind of evolution of language over time. But those are the two, the three kind of areas of linguistics that people in the United States study. Are, is linguistics, is this a specialty that's really limited to the spoken version of a language or written or is it both? It can encompass a lot. I mean, linguistics, it depends on what kind of linguist you're talking to, right? So um, I do discourse analysis and text analysis, which is written language. Um, but when we're talking about the study of linguistics, we are talking, talking about spoken language. Um, but that doesn't limit it to studying the impact of writing on language itself, right? Because writing and spoken language are very different. They're two different things. Um, and sometimes people tend to conflate them. So my graduate work in my master's program was on um, orthographic knowledge and how it's taught to emerging bilingual students in ESL programs. So I wasn't specifically looking at writing just as kind of a text analysis, but I was looking at or, uh, orthography as a medium of like how students are learning. Um, so we do consider the written language, but we're much more interested in kind of how spoken language moves and evolves and works in its structure, form, and use. Sure. How many languages do you speak? So this is a funny thing about linguists. Um, a lot of people think that linguists speak multiple languages, but a lot of us don't speak more than one language at all. Most of us are monolingual um, because it's not so much about speaking a language fluently. It's about understanding the structure of language. Um, but I do speak um, Spanish in terms of the fact that I can make my way through a conversation and I do speak a little bit of Arabic. Um, but that is, that is really, I'm, I would consider myself mostly monolingual, which is, you know, a product of my upbringing. <laughs> sure. Sure. Now with, to be fluent in a language, you're, are you both, so, and not you particularly, but generally speaking, 
Is a person fluent in speaking a language and fluent in writing a language? Is it separate? Is the fluency separate? So there are, um, when we talk about like second language acquisition, there are different domains that can, that can develop quicker than others. So you can be better at reading in a language than you are at speaking a language, or you can be better at speaking a language and not have the ability to read it. So they are different, they are different processes. Um, so for instance, I can read Arabic, but there are times when I don't know what I'm reading, but I can read the language, right? Like I can read the language to myself. Um, but they do tend to be kind of separate mediums. Sure, sure. But fluency, I'm, if you're asking, I'm sorry, you were asking about fluency. In terms yes. of fluency, fluency is a, is a complicated definition, right? Because if we're talking about functional fluency, fluency is if you're able to speak to people and get around and go about your daily business and ask questions and have a conversation and people can understand you and you can understand them, why would you need to be more fluent than that, correct? So right. there's different um, understandings of fluency. Now, if you're talking about academic fluency, would you be able to pass the aisles? Would you be able to write a, a book in a second language? That's a different kind of fluency. So even the idea of what is fluent is a little bit complicated when we're talking about second language acquisition. That's interesting. That's interesting. So I, I had read that there are between 6,500 and 7,000 languages spoken in the world today but just around 23 languages account for more than half of the world's population. And the big three would be Chinese, Spanish, and English. Now these numbers may all be off a little bit, but I think they're roughly probably pretty accurate. But Chinese is the most spoken language, followed by Spanish, followed by English. Mm -hmm. So I'm curious, so how does a language go dead? And what would you say the last language was to go dead? Um, in terms of how languages be you know, die, um, it, it has to do a lot with native speakers, right? So if you lose native speakers because of globalization or oftentimes oppression, um, if people aren't allowed to speak their language, if they're not teaching it in schools to children, languages die because there fails to be any native speakers of that language. Um, and also languages like, like Latin, right, is considered not a functional language, right? People aren't speaking it day to day. That's not an oral language that we really use anymore, but people still read in it, right? So it can become just a medium of, it can become a language of just writing. Um, as far as the last dead language, I'm actually not sure. I will, I will use my statement that you use in academia when you give presentations. I'll have to look into that. <laughs> <laughs> well, I wondered if Latin was maybe the last major language, although it's probably a smaller, like a tribal language that's gone more than anything, but that, that is probably more accurate um, simply because we do have a problem of languages flattening and more people um, losing their native languages. So, and then you can have language revitalization. So there's um, one example is there's like an Athabascan language that uh, was revitalized through revitalization efforts. So if you have even just one native speaker that creates a curriculum for students or starts teaching it, then you can start to revitalize languages that were considered dead. Um, so it can, it can, even a dead language can, can be revived in a way. Is the emoji a language? Oh, fun question. Is the emoji, I would, so technically, if we're speaking linguistically, the emoji is not a language because it doesn't have internal grammar. Um, the, but we use emojis as a language feature, right? Um, so as language evolves and we have this new, you know, this new thing to use as our, in our language, it's a way for us to speak more efficiently. So it's not considered its own language because it doesn't have grammar. It doesn't have, you know, it doesn't have a natural grammar to it, but it does, it does carry so much meaning and it can, it can, create so much meaning in spaces that you know language might not have other created that uh, otherwise created that meaning especially with people who may not speak the same language right so right. it's actually a universal language feature right that you might not be able to speak a language that you're of the person that you're speaking to but you might be able to convey exactly what you wanted to say in that language with an emoji um, interesting 
So long story short, it's not considered a language per se, but it is very much a universal language feature that we are using more and more to communicate. I mean, there are uh, second language emergent bilingual teachers that use emojis to work with their students who are newcomers. So if you have a student who you don't have any um, mutual intelligibility with, you can use emojis because they probably are familiar with them because kids are digital natives now. So, you yeah. know, they're becoming this like beautiful linguistic feature that people, you know, tend to criticize, but in many ways, um, it's just how language works and it's just becoming something that is going to stick around in our language probably for the foreseeable future. So in emoji would be, is missing a lot of the elements that really makes a real language, but were there languages throughout time that didn't have a spoken portion where maybe they were just written, were there like symbolic type, what was hieroglyphics? Hieroglyphics wasn't spoken, was it? But it was still treated as a language? Is that act? I don't know. So I want to ask you if you know, but I'm just curious if there were spoken versions of languages that never had a written component or a written version of a language that never had a spoken component. Does that make sense? There can be, there can be many oral languages that don't have any written component, right? They don't have any orthography. Um, mm -hmm. But yes, I mean, when we think about writing, writing moves much slower than speech. So we speak, we use writing to represent speech, not the other way around, right? Um, so if your language and your environment does not require you to have a written writing system, then there's no need for it. Right. Um, so in terms of hieroglyphics, um, they represent words that people were using, but that's not, it's not a direct translation in the way that we would understand it. Right. It's just a different orthographic. It's just a different orthographic device. Sure. But Interesting. People, some, one time somebody tried to make that analogy with me of, you know, emojis aren't evolved because we used to use symbols to convey language and it's so simple. That is a very like Eurocentric Western perspective of thinking that our orthographic systems and the way that we write and speak is somehow just simply more evolved than other people's because that's just not true. <laughs> um, right. You know, evolution isn't about becoming more complex and strong it's the survival of the fittest thing is a little bit of a misleading statement it really is about efficiency and adaptation right so if an emoji right. is the most efficient way to talk to someone then that is a very valid and very complex and very logical evolution of language so in the in the which comes first the chicken or the egg debate which came first the written or the spoken would it be the spoken? Would spoken that make language, sense? yeah. Spoken okay. language. So we started with grunts and hisses and, and that evolved into something more probably. Yes, I mean, there are people that argue that, uh, you know, there is artwork that could have represented written language, um, but that is up for debate amongst anthropologists. So I don't want to speak too, too much on that because I'll have the archeologists come for me. Um, <laughs> Yeah. But I mean, in terms of being able to or needing this, the, the need to communicate is verbal first, right? Sure. Um, so yeah, I mean, we, we used utterances before we required written language. Yeah, it's, it's fascinating to me. So I try to, you know, uh, obviously I'm probably underutilizing your skill set as educated as you are, but I like to always kind of bring things back down for like, the average listener of the podcast and really kind of give them the basics of how these things started, because I, I don't think a lot of people really think about that. You, you know, most people don't think beyond the English language they learned in, you know, middle school and high school and right, the right. most basic vocabulary and vowel sounds and consonants that you learned in elementary school. So I, I find it really interesting to dig into this and figure out the origins of these things and kind of theorize Mm -hmm. you know, who were, who were making the first words and how did they come about and this need to communicate among people and to evolve with that level of communication is, is really interesting to me. I want to move over to dialect. Mm -hmm. So explain what the difference is between a language and a dialect. So the difference, the working definition, and we have to be careful when we say that the working definition of the difference between a language and a dialect is mutual intelligibility. Um, 
which means that that if you are not able to communicate with somebody in their language, you do not have mutual intelligibility, right? So somebody who is speaking Mandarin and someone who is speaking English do not have mutual intelligibility, right? So none of the, nothing that they say to one another is really going to be understood if the other doesn't have a knowledge of that other language. Right. Um, dialects are considered to have some mutual intelligibility, but the problem with that statement is that ultimately the difference between a language and a dialect is very political, right? Um, so there are some languages that have mutual intelligibility that are not considered dialects, like Spanish and Portuguese, right? So if somebody that speaks Spanish might be able to communicate with someone in Portuguese, um, but then there are languages that, or then there are dialects that don't have mutual intelligibility that are not considered their own languages. So there are many Arabic dialects that are considered dialects um, that don't have mutual intelligibility, but all fall under this cultural category of Arabic speaking. So it's very political at some point, right? So one, somebody asked me recently, is British English or is American English a dialect of British English? And it's like, technically no, because of that political thing, right? So. Right you know, we could talk about how the American dialect evolved out of people, you know, out of colonialism and out of, you know, British dialect, but that doesn't mean that English, American English is a dialect of British English because of the political separation of those two. So it's right. very complex. And then accents are completely different in that people often conflate dialects and accents and accent really only has to do with pronunciation. Right. So, sure. um, so if I, you know, I'm from the Northeast. So like the way that my grandmother talked, she said, what a walk the dog, right? Dog as a part, as opposed to dog is a difference is an accent difference rather than a dialect difference. Got you. Okay. So, so when I, in high school, I learned German first mm -hmm. and, uh, and I remember that my German teacher, was teaching us a southern regional variety of German because that mm -hmm. was what she knew. She said, there's going to be modern standard German and then there's going to be regional varieties of German and then you're gonna have things like Swiss German. Yep. And she said, and they're all kind of different in a way. Yes. From the simplest things on like how you say hi and the variation right. might be the difference in hi and howdy, you know? And uh, it was, so it was really interesting uh, to, to, to see that. So I guess, so would you say dialects would be defined more by the region that they're in or are they based on ethnicity or social class or are they just educational breaches where the the language kind of became something a little different would you do any of those things make sense yes and i would say yes to all because the problem yeah so i would say yes in some cases all of those things could apply right um yeah. So it can depend on how people want to separate by education, right? So in the United States, we use, we learn something called standard American English in schools, right? As this separate dialect, although that's like a very abstract concept. It's very racialized in many ways. It's like a whole different conversation, but that is what we learn as the standard, right? Um, but then you have regional dialects that only differ by, I don't know, a few words that someone is using. Um, so it, it depends on the context of the, of the language and dialect that you're talking about, how it's perceived and how it's interpreted as either a dialect or a language. Um, there's, a, there's a really famous quote that um, his name is Max Weinreich, said a, a language is a dialect with an army and a navy to kind of emphasize this idea of it being very political, right? And so a language is just, it's a dialect that, you know, has a bit more complexity in terms of what it considers its boundaries. Right, right. It, it's fast. So I was going to ask you about whether accents affected those variations of pronunciation affected a dialect and you answered that already now i grew up in the midwest mm -hmm. and um and you know you see kentucky and you know mississippi in the south like you have some of these states that are on the bottom of lists of 
departments of education, you know, like they're the worst places to be schooled in the country. Mm -hmm. And, um, and I always found it interesting, particularly growing up near Kentucky, how you have English teachers that have such bad pronunciation of things. And they they have such, like they all have Kentucky twangs and they'll mispronounce words and they're teaching kids English while not really practicing English properly or even kind of enunciating things properly. And I feel like this is that, that kind of that educational breach that you're, she's teaching that dialect kind of because of this breach in education. Does that make sense? Um, can you clarify what you mean by educational bre breach a little bit? <clears throat> um, that the teacher is subpar. So, I think one of the things that's important about linguistics and language in general is to understand that language hierarchies are culturally constructed. So we do recognize that Southern English is a very uh, stigmatized variation, right? So the way that people pronounce things is very stigmatized. Um, yet we want students to use often the standard American English for very real reasons because the language hierarchy of standard American English can can impact somebody's ability to get a job or, you know, how the world treats them. Um, but when we're talking about pronunciation, the problem with saying the correct pronunciation is that if that's how they say it, then that's the correct pronunciation. Ah, right. Interesting. So they might not even notice that it's a different pronunciation because it's just how they say it right um, sure. so like someone said you're saying dog wrong because I have a New Jersey accent I would say I'm not saying you understood that I said dog right true so so I think that's like an important thing to remember in terms of education is that this institutional language of standard American English really um, articulates what we think of as incorrect or or better in terms of language um, but often, you know, people don't, people, that's just the way people say things. Um, and that's how, that's how languages have always worked, right? If you can understand somebody, then is it really incorrect or correct, right? Sure. So is a dialect reflective in the written form as well? Or is it just something that's detected when spoken? Interesting. So I would say that an accent definitely is the one that's, that can only be detected when spoken because it has to do solely with pronunciation. Um, but a dialect, I mean, if you're writing in a particular dialect and you use vocabulary or words that are not, that are exclusive to that dialect, then yeah, I mean, it'll come across in the way that you're writing, right? So if you, I'm trying to think, I went to school in the South for three years and I remember somebody saying to me, um, what's the word that I'm thinking of? Um, a palette. So to me, a palette means something very different than it does in the South. Um, oh. I believe it means like a sleeping bag. Um, and I did not know that. Uh, so yeah. if somebody writes that to you and your idea of a palette is not that, right? A palette to me is like a palette of wood or a palette of some, some kind of item that's being stored. Um, then that's going to cause some miscommunication. So in that sense, if somebody writes something that way, if they use a different terminology, then yeah, I mean, it's going to, it's going to come across in the way that you write. Right, right. And, and it would be the same thing with like modifiers with inflections or upticks or downticks. So these things aren't necessarily reflective in the written form. Right? Right, right. Um, I, yeah, anything that I guess is, is pronunciation would not really be reflected in the written form. Um, but anything that's you know, lexical, like in a lexical item or syntax, if there's a syntax variation, that will come across, right? Um, but that's because we're often trained to default to the standard when we're taught in schools, right? So even if, sure. even if somebody says, so there are like multiple accents across the United States that say ax instead of ask. And that's a perfectly valid way to say the word ask, right? Um, but when they write it, they might still write ask because in school they've been taught that's standard American English, right? Sure. So the idea of this like standard is very important for how people write versus how they speak. 
Um, which is why I try to always remind people that like the way that people write and the way that people speak is very, very different. You, uh, one of your TikTok videos was about the, uh, the transatlantic accent or the transatlantic dialect or accent. I can't remember yeah. what you called it, but I always heard it as the mid-Atlantic from being yeah, told in television it, yeah. mm -hmm. was the mid-Atlantic. So that was a, was that a real, so if, for one, is that a dialect or is that an accent? It's an accent in that it has mostly to do with pronunciation and it was meant to be regionally neutral, right? So a dialect would have to be kind of like tied to something, but sure. a, an accent, it was meant to be regionally neutral. And you know, a lot of people, I should have defined this more in that TikTok because I've had a lot of people say, what are you talking about? It's taught in schools. So when I say that it's taught to people, I don't mean that people were signing up for the course, right? When they went to school. Um, but when you go to school and somebody tells you to say that you're saying something wrong, right? If a teacher corrects you for the way that you're saying something and the way that they're, they're recasting what you're saying or the way that they're correcting what you're saying is typical of a mid-Atlantic accent, then that's, that is you being, you know, subtly taught how to speak in this particular way. Yeah. Um, kind of unmarked accent. Um, and so we see that that's why it's called a social dialect, right? Because it's not something that is regionally specific. It is, it is taught as a standard and it is often a standard through which um, kind of social class and education is perceived rather than regional origin. Yeah. So what I find interesting about this is, um, so you, today, the kind of the term in the television and film world is you have a neutral television accent. They don't want you, it doesn't matter if you grew up in the South, you kill that accent to be yes. in Hollywood. You have to talk just absolutely normal with no detection of where you're from. Yeah, everyone is ethnically ambiguous today, <laughs> really mm -hmm. on television and film. But I wasn't sure if this mid-Atlantic accent was actually real that it was really something that was developing or whether it was something that was created for entertainment, since that was such a common method for actors to, de to de deliver in, especially in early film. You don't hear that much now. But, no, but it fell out of favor um, because people recognized that it was very specific for a, a certain group, right? And so it kind of just fell out of favor after a while. Um, but this idea, I mean, it is real in the sense that it was genuinely spoken by people in order to kind of make a regionally neutral speech pattern. Yeah. Um, but it is not something that, and you know, I say this gently because many people are, you know, claim that they grew up speaking transatlantic, which is, I believe that, but you also probably were socialized to speak that way, right, by people around you who were also speaking this way. Um, it is not something that we consider a regional accent of the United States. So this neutral accent, so if you think of like BBC English also, these like neutral accents are created so that you can't identify somebody's origin, somebody's uh, social class. Um, and it's, that is why it, while it's not real, it is very real in the sense that when somebody hears it, it, it achieves its goal of being neutral, right? Right, right. Great. And I was cu very curious about that. It was one of my favorite TikTok videos when you addressed that. And I wanted to definitely bring it up. And another one that I'm going to go into now um, that seems rather controversial is that 30 million word gap. Ah, uh, yes. So is this a real thing? Was this a real study? So is yes. this a real thing? And explain it to people. And is there a difference really in the lower and the middle class student in terms of what they're, they're getting? So the 30 million word gap was based on this study that was done. Um, and the results of it are, are controversial today because the sampling that they did was not efficient. The, the entire study people critique itself. Um, but it was a, based on this idea that children that enter school from um, low income neighborhoods or um, communities of uh, students of color had 30 million less words in their vocabulary upon entering school than middle class white students. And the problem that we now recognize with that is that what you're assuming is that only your words are the words that count, right? So what we don't recognize are that people do have dialect variations. You know, that was written at a time when um, African American vernacular English was not recognized as a dialect. Not, you know, it wasn't recognized as like a legitimate 
logical, it wasn't recognized within American culture as something that is a very valid dialect for people to speak and many people do. So in terms of the 30 million word gap, it really is a question of, of what, whose words, right? So if we're talking about a bilingual student who's who is a heritage speaker who speaks Spanish in the home, right? And you assume that they are missing 30 million words when they enter school. Um, what you're actually saying is that the, all of the words that they know in their home language don't matter. And that's just empirically false, like that's just false, right? Because right. if you're bilingual, you likely know far more words than any white middle-class monolingual student, right? Right. Um, so now, you know, that study has been has has been rejected by many sociolinguists and many linguistic anthropologists and educational linguists. Unfortunately, though, it is grabbed, it is latched onto often for these initiatives of, of closing the quote achievement gap, right? Um, and assuming that the fix to that is to introduce students to standard American English and white people speech, right? Um, yeah. and that's, you know, it's simply just the wrong way to think about how kids learn and acquire language, because what we really find is that students, that children acquire about the same amount of language, regardless of their, of their community, of their race, ethnicity, or home language. Right. Because you would think a lot of that would have to do with a curriculum that a school system was teaching, and also the amount of time that a student would have to study or to research or to read more and a lot would, you know, be the assignments. You're like, I think at least in the public school I went to for, you know, 30, 40, 50 years, it was the same books everyone read. It was the same curriculums everyone got. Um, so you would think there would really 30 million words seems like a lot. <laughs> that seems like a lot of words. Right, and, uh, right. And, um, and the problem with that is that um, the curriculum in schools are often based on a very specific dialect and very specific way of speaking and knowing. Um, so if you are in a school as a student who has a different home language or has a different home dialect and you show up to school and all you're expected to understand is this very particular version of English and you don't know it, then of course it's going to seem like you have a 30 million word gap. But what's actually happening is that just the, the language that you do speak is not being valued and it's not being considered, it's not being, accessed as a fund of knowledge for you. Um, and that's, that's kind of the problem, right? Is that why doesn't, why don't curricula reflect the way that students actually speak in their communities and the funds of knowledge that they have? Um, so that's kind of an important thing in my work is looking at, okay, is it, is it a matter of an achievement gap or is it a matter of representation in the curriculum? Um, True. So. True. So if that if that does exist on some level, if, if I'm suffering from it and I'm aware of it, how do I fix it? Is it just that I need advanced education? Do I buy a dictionary and start learning, learning new words? Like, do I just need to read? Like, what do I do? Do I communicate more? How do I fix that myself? If a person out there of, listening. In terms of not knowing academic English? Yeah, or maybe not being on the level of someone else. So, I th okay, so this is, uh, this is a complicated question because on one hand, I would never, you know, we have to recognize that students do need uh, academic English is what I like to call it um, in order to be successful in the current pu public school environment that we have. Um, but at the same time, I think rather than putting the burden on the student to learn other people's words, right, that I think schools should be a little bit more engaged in, in accessing those funds of knowledge that the students come to school with, right? You want to meet your kids where they are, not put the burden on them and their families to speak the way that you speak, right? Because that's, that's not how we like to think. <laughs> that's sure. not how we like to think in, in terms yeah. of being diverse and being um, multilingual, right? Because we have this idea that like monolingualism is a default in the United States, which it is, but in most of the world, that's not the case, right? So my thing is if you are trying to advance academic English, you can take an academic English class. But I also think that it's really important for teachers to make it explicit to students that academic English is a particular register that you learn through schooling. Um, and that there is, there is a time and a place for it, 
but that speaking your home language and speaking your home dialect is absolutely valid and it doesn't indicate that you are less intelligent, less informed, or have some kind of 30 million deficit sure. um, in general, right? Yeah. Yeah. No, that's good. That's good. I was just, I was just curious in terms of if I like, I never went to college. Anything I've wanted to learn, I've learned on my own. <laughs> mm -hmm. So as I've made my way through life, I just gathered the information or found what I wanted on my own. I think I have the aptitude to, to, to pick these things up as I go, but I never had any, any education on the university level. And, um, yeah, but, but I mean, what, if, you're, if you're doing self-study, right, then you're, sure. going to, you're going to be exposed to academic English constantly if you're reading textbooks or you're reading academic right. books. Um, so in that way, I mean, I even think that that's kind of um, like a subversive way of learning too, right? That you didn't sure. need to be in college in order to gain this academic knowledge that they want you to pay for, right? <laughs> that, you know, right. you can kind of do bad all on your own in that sense. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think like reading academic, reading authentic texts that are, you know, textbooks from academic fields, you can build that, you can build that register all on your own, for sure. Right, right. And you would say that the amount of words a person knows, how deep their vocabulary goes, maybe let's take someone in a field that they're PhD or they're medical doctor, whoever they are, and maybe they're the terminology that they have in the field that they're in is vast. So by default, they may have more words than say the average citizen working at a Walmart. But that is that really indicative of a person being more intelligent? Can someone be yeah. a math whiz and they don't have the vocabulary to articulate big conversations, but Absolutely. they know everything there is to know about math. So it's not necessarily an indicator of intelligence. No, I always yeah. try to emphasize that it's not. Um, especially when you're thinking about mm, language for a particular field, right? So you can teach English for business or you can teach English for a content area. Um, and if you're specializing in something that has a register of, you know, it has a particular lexicon, it has a particular register, um, that just means that you learned how to speak in that register, right? Like yeah. I sometimes use academic jargon and have to check myself, but it's because I'm so socialized to use it around people in graduate school. Um, but then there are things that I say to people in graduate school because like I'm a first gen kid from um, a working class town in, in Tom's River, um, New Jersey. So there are some things that I say to academics and they balk at it. They're like, what did you just say? So, you know, no, intelligence is not indicated is, you know, the way that you speak is often not indicative of your intelligence level. It has to do with your language socialization and what kind of language you are around, right? And what kind of language you need to survive and exist in the world. Um, like there's no reason for me to have a register of mechanic terms of you know car mechanics i don't know i call it the thing the thingamabob on my car right <laughs> um, yeah right so but that doesn't mean that but somebody who's a mechanic is often you know might not be perceived as having the same level of education as somebody who's in a phd but if i looked at a car i wouldn't know what i was looking at in the first place right so yeah. I, I like to kind of de destabilize that understanding of like, well, you speak big words, so you must be really smart. It's like, it's not that. It's what, what are you using that language for? What do you need in order to be successful in your particular field or your particular environment in the world? So you used a big word though. You said thingamabob. So I'm not even <laughs> sure if that's a real word. Is that just slang or is that actually a thingamabob? A <laughs> I don't know. Um, I think that's from a Disney the, Disney movie, uh, Little Mermaid. You want thingamabobs? I've got plenty. So that's yeah. a that's a Disney term. Um, but if I looked at a car, I wouldn't know. I mean, I know windshields. I know windshield wiper, seatbelt, and seat. That's about it. Yeah. That's about I it. I use I use flugelbinder. Is that? But you know, I don't know. That might be a real word too. But but um, I say flugel the flugel binder. the flugel binder over there needs to be fixed. <laughs> that's a good, is that a is that a regional Indiana thing? I don't know. I don't know where it came from. It's just something that goes like I remember using it when I was little. You know, it was. Uh, I don't know where I got it from. It might I be like regional. It I like it. You know, language is is so infinitely creative um, that you know we can make up a word that means semantically. You know, might not mean much, but it means a lot because it indicates. I don't actually know what that thing is called. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. That's true. So, you know, I want to move into something that, that I think is really fascinating with 
with the with language and where these words are so important. And I want to get into kind of the power of words. Mm-hmm. One of the reasons I wanted to have you on the show is I actually think that you have one of the most important jobs in the world. So I'm going to inflate your ego a little bit here. Oh, Louise, okay. <laughs> <laughs> because really, you're in a kind of a position where, and, and create probably isn't the proper word here, but you maybe create and analyze kind of the, the code that programs a human being. Because it seems that without words, without language, we would just really be grunting monkeys. So what we've done is somehow humans have been able to become programmed with words. Words become sentences, sentences become language, we communicate, we all evolve, we become technologically advanced, and we are in the world where we're at now, probably simply because of this level of communication. And with you being a linguist, you're a very important, you're almost like a computer programmer in a way. You're kind of coding things. You're coding the stuff we have to have to function as kind of high functioning humans. Does this make sense what I'm saying? Yeah, I mean, people have, I, I would definitely, I would definitely say that being a linguist doesn't pay as well as being a computer programmer, but sure, I'll rock on with that, with that analogy. Yeah, I mean, so, so people have, people compare it to that quite often. Yes. So, so, th- so I find this really interesting because we are somehow programmed to understand language. I'm not exactly sure how all that works. I grew up learning words from the first ones that my parents taught me to the first ones they taught me in kindergarten and learning the alphabet and, and, and moving on from there. And then every year, first, second, third, fourth, fifth grade, vocabulary list, weekly vocabulary list, vocabulary list, learning to pronounce words. Somehow the words become sentences. And without even realizing it, all of a sudden you're able to communicate with the kids around you. It's fascinating to me how this works. And what's even more interesting than that, and what I really want to get into here, is how a word can trigger an emotional response. Mm -hmm. Because that's more than just learning the word. Like, sure, I learned to say the word love in third grade. I didn't have an emotional response connected to it, though. And the interesting thing about words is that you can be cut down and insulted by words. People have committed suicide. People have committed suicide because of words, you know? Yes. And yes. You, can, you can also be inspired and you can feel loved. And this, I want you to comment on this power that words have. I mean, to me, words are everything, right? It's mm-hmm. everything. Um, words convey, words create the world around us, right? So there's a theory of something called speech act theory, which is different than a regular utterance of kind of just stating a thought or a fact. But a speech act is, if I say to you, um, go close the window, and you go close the window, I've impacted the, the, the real tangible world with my, with my words, right? Yeah. Um, and that extends, that's like at the semantic and pragmatic level of language, which is my favorite part of language, is what language indexes, what it does, what it literally does in the world around us. Um, And it's incredibly powerful. And in terms of from anything from, you know, making somebody feel loved and appreciated to making them feel cut down and out of themselves, but even on a level of um, words can impact what happens to whole countries, right? Um, What happens to how people are perceived and how we come to understand the world around us beyond even how we feel internally. Um, That all of that is words. Um, And so they're never neutral. Language and words are never, ever, ever neutral. Nothing about language is neutral. Now, language is arbitrary. That is true. Um, And that's this idea of, you know, you can have a sign, a signifier, and a signified, which is, that's a sociore's idea of the, the sign, signifier, and signified, where you have the word for something, you have the actual object that it's indexing, and then you have the meaning of that thing, right? So understanding language is a, is a relationship between those three things, right? Um, so it's never just the sign, right? You can never just have the, the word in the abstract. Words are never neutral. Um, 
And what I mean by that is when whatever you, your word is signifying has meaning that comes from your experience or what you've been taught or what you've been socialized to understand, right? Um, so people say like, we all see red differently. Like we all see the word red differently. Well, we all hear the word chair differently. When I say chair, the image that comes to your mind will be different than the word that comes to my mind. Um, and so that I think is like where language exists in that in the meaning of it in the what it does in the real world um so yeah i mean i think people i think people are a little bit too flippant with words and that they don't realize that they are never neutral um even if you think they are they're never neutral um so yeah i mean that's the that's everything that i care about in terms of language is just understanding that everything you say everything you do with words they're never they're never just words so. yeah yeah when when um so i want to maybe use two examples here which i think are interesting so a lot of times when you are when you are uh, creating a thought <clears throat> so the some of the stronger thoughts that you create these thought constructs the the stronger ones are usually associated with an emotion that happened during the event mm -hmm. so that's not necessarily it has to do exactly with words because it might just have been a visual experience or an audible experience right. or music or something else that triggers you. But what I find interesting is you, you, you're given the word love when you're young and then you're giving a meaning to the word love and what it's supposed to be. And then you have to take that word love and you have to separate it into many different things like the love you have for Harry Potter movies versus the love your parents have for you versus and we only have one word for it right yeah yeah testament to which is a testament to like the English language right so yeah. that's like the secure work hypothesis that language influences culture and culture influences language right like we have 15 yeah words, we have 15 words for sandwich but we have one word for love um, right right and, you know? and where where I was going to go with this was was um and then there's the kind of the passionate love right mm -hmm. so you grow up and you love watching Harry Potter movies. You get it. You get the definition, right? And then you, you know how your parents feel about you, how they love you versus how your friends are around you and you make a distinction. But you grow up and you grow up and you grow up and you're waiting for that other definition of love, which is the passionate love. And then mm -hmm. somehow you recognize it. And I find that really yeah, interesting that yeah. when you, you'll know it when you see it, really. And I think yeah. that's really kind of cool that that programming exists on that level. And it was explained to you so early on and you're just waiting for it, waiting for it. And it's so special, you know, that's yeah. why people will never forget the first time someone told them that they love them. In right. A passionate and not, way. In the, not in your parents kind of way. Yeah. I mean, I think mm -hmm. that's like the most beautiful lang thing about language is that it's like emancipatory in, in some ways, right? Like that once you know how to articulate a feeling or an emotion, you can, you can convey that to the world around you, right? So a lot of times people say like, I didn't know the words to say this. If you, once you get that word, like you're so free to exist in the world around you in any capacity that you want to exist in. Um, you're not, you're, you have no barriers in that way. Um, so when you know what love feels like and you have a word for it, you're like, oh man, that's it. And it becomes so crystallized in kind of your existence as a human, right? Um, so that you know when you say, I love my parents, but I love my spouse, right? That you understand the semantic difference between those two things because of your experience of it in the world. Right. Um, so yeah, I mean, language is so freeing in that way that, you know, it's tied to memory and emotion and experience. And we have an infinite capacity to learn language, not learn language in terms of how to speak it. There's just this Noam Chomsky's um, theory of the infinite capacity to learn language is like a very human trait that we can, we as human beings have an infinite capacity. There is no like difference between, um, there's, it's not a sign of intellect of being able to acquire the idea of language and words, right? right. Barring, barring developmental problems with language or aphasias or things like that, that, you know, we are all capable of infinite language if we if as human beings um and so once we start to access it it's it's very freeing as as a human right because it's how we connect with other humans that's how we connect with the world yeah 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 and, and also on the other end of the spectrum here you words can be weapons yes. for a long time 
things like bullying were commonplace. No one really got in trouble for that. I, I was particularly bullied throughout school. I mm. was a, a big nerd. I didn't particularly dress well. I didn't really have any sense of style. <laughs> and, um, and my high school years were very difficult because I didn't actually fit in with any of the kind of the outcast groups. I wasn't with the band kids. I wasn't with the skateboarders. I had like two friends all through high school. But I, I knew where I wanted to go and what I wanted to be. And I just knew I needed to kind of weather the storm of bullying until I could fully be able to realize the vision of what I wanted to be in the world. And I, and I succeeded in my goals in that regard. Right. So I kind of used it as fuel to, to push me forward. But a lot of people just ch want to check out from bullying. And this really comes, and, I, and it wasn't physical bullying. It was word bullying, you know. Right, and right, this, right. Was, this was pre-internet. This was pre-social media where now you can really be destroyed on social media on the biggest level. And, yeah. and, and for a long time, you weren't criminalized because of words. Should words be criminalized? If I beat someone up with my words so much that they kill themselves, am I a murderer for that? I think you are responsible. Mm -hmm. you, you are accountable for that, for sure. And I mean, I think that has been persecuted. Um, especially in terms of like younger kids. Um, because words, again, are not neutral and you can't say, oh, it's just a word they shouldn't have been, you know, you shouldn't have been hurt by it. That's not how language works. That's not how words work because there is no such thing as not having intent with words. Whether you were trying to just hurt them or whether you meant it, right? The intent is not the point, it's the impact. Yeah. So that's, you know what I mean? Like you could say, I don't, I know, I don't mean this and uh, this might be a controversial thing to say, but like I could, I could shoot a gun in the air and be like, well, I didn't intend to, to hit someone, right? Like I didn't intend to shoot someone. It doesn't matter because you did, right? Like if I shoot a gun into the air and I'm like just shooting at the sky and then somebody is hit by that bullet, right? It doesn't, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter if I didn't mean to do it. <laughs> right. The impact of it is the same. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that um, when people say things like, you know, freedom of speech, they're not understanding that freedom of speech is not a matter of not being hateful, right? Like it's not, it doesn't have to do with just saying whatever you want and not having consequences or having account and having to take accountability for what you've said. You can right. say whatever you want, but it doesn't mean that you're not going to have, you know, consequences for the things you say, just like, you know, your actions have consequences, your words have consequences as well. Um, so yeah, I mean, I fully believe that people need to be held responsible and accountable for the things they say. And once you know better, you do better, right? Um, right. And I think that's like why I, I love the idea of bringing the idea, the understanding of linguistics to students, because I think a lot of them don't under, not understand, don't understand. Children are far more intelligent than we mostly give them credit for. Um, they're just not given the, art, the way to articulate that, right? Like they're not given the, the knowledge they need to articulate how words are not neutral and how to process them. Um, like for example, when I was younger, I just made a video about this today. I did not know that I had a learning disability. So the way that people responded to the things that I did and the things that happened to me, um, became kind of crystallized in my mind as deficits, right? Um, and now as an adult, I have a way to articulate what is happening to me when I can't focus or when I lose things or when something goes wrong. Um, and that ability to do that has changed my, in, like internally has changed me for being able to have the, the, the words for understanding what's some, what is happening, right? Yeah. Um, so yeah, I mean, that's for sure. <laughs> Yeah. Has, and do you think social media has helped or hurt our ability to communicate? Oh, that's a tough one. Do I think? <sighs> While I... you're thinking about it, I'll tell you my opinion on it. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Tell me your opinion first. So uh, I'm a kind of a product of the America Online world. When that explosion happened, and I consider America Online in its, in its prime, probably the first social media. In fact, if you look at Facebook today, it really is almost a complete replica of what America Online was. Right. And, and of course, Facebook even, if it had, it think we've evolved past that. We've evolved to Instagram and Snapchat and TikTok and all of these other ways in which people put themselves out there. Mm -hmm. I think generally social media has hurt people 
in unrealistic expectations of what you should become or what you are. I think most people aren't at all what they represent themselves to be online. For sure. And there is a huge, um, uh, there's there's a there's a huge push to just have so many that you need to have followers that's the thing you have to have these followers you have to have all these people that that hang on every word and there's a lot of unrealistic expectations there and I, generally i think it, it, it this has been a, a a trend that's been happening for a long time it kind of actually started with it even goes i think further back if you if you think about the how video games have moved forward and how the listening experience of music has moved forward when I was young, you would have people that would get together and you'd listen to an, an album or a CD and we'd have a listening party, people would get together. And then at some point there was this shift of, you know, you have an iPod and you have headphones and you have a personal listening experience. It wasn't about socializing with people listening to this musical experience anymore. Right. And, and I saw that happening in video games. You used to get together and everyone would play Nintendo. And now it's you sit in your basement and you play against someone who's on the other side of the world in that capacity. And I feel like social media has separated people a lot and that they're just, their friend is their phone and that's who they're sitting with in their car for two hours right. where they could have driven to meet their friend who they're texting. Like it's, it's really crazy. And the only high point of social media I think we got was during, during the pandemic when people were isolated, you didn't see as many people posturing for, you know, here's a discount on something I'm offering to my people that follow me, or there were fewer bikini photos of people online. And then you started to see celebrities, like wearing their emotions on their sleeve, talking about what it's like for them to be at home. And then you started having people, comedians would get on and they would, they would broadcast live for the, everyone with no money involved. And then, you know, Bono's on his front porch playing songs and everyone's helping everyone. Mm -hmm. And then the Zoom community picks up and people get, and I think we saw the best of social media for four months. Yes. And now we're kind of back to where we're at. So I know this was a really long round. No, that's okay. Um, weird way to explain it, but I'm curious how you feel about it. Has it hurt people communicating or has it helped? What do you think about that? Okay. So my answer is that it's still, I agree with a lot of the things that you said. And I also think that it's very complex because social media, if you think about it, is a tool to do what? Communicate, right? To socialize. Um, but I think because of that, people are able to more quickly put the worst parts of themselves into the public eye, right? So the parts of yourself that you maybe, maybe only one or two people saw, like now you can broadcast it to the whole world <laughs> to cancel you, right? Yeah. Um, right. So I think because of the nature of what social media achieves, which is connecting people and connecting communication and making communication easier, I think all of the things that are beautiful and terrible about language are also terrible and beautiful about social media, right? That you, we have now had the ability to connect people across the world, right? To, in a way, know that we're not alone in what was happening during the pandemic, the height of the pandemic, right? That we could watch Andrea Bocelli sing outside of Il Duomo. Was that where he did? I believe that's where he sang. Um, right. The whole world was able to watch that. That is a beautiful moment of solidarity that is global. Like uh, my mind was blown by that, knowing that it wasn't just a global moment, like a, a moment of solidarity for people that were watching. It was a global moment of solidarity that everybody's experiencing this horrible thing at the same time. And we are all connecting through this stream right now. Um, so in that way, I think it's beautiful. I also think social media is beautiful in that for many people, social media has advanced their communication. So you have people with like nonverbal, um, developmental issues or people that are just nonverbal in general that are that are quite verbal because of the use of the internet because of the use of social media that have been able to connect with humanity in a way that you know speech may not have facilitated the ability their ability to do so i think that in a lot of ways social media is beautiful because of the way that it's it helps people communicate but i also think that we did it like it advanced so quickly that we were not able to catch up to it in terms of being emotionally mature for it. <laughs> if that sure. makes sense. Like, I don't yeah. think that we had the ability to catch up to understand the impact of social media, that writing something online is just as hurtful as saying it in person. 
right? That it doesn't right. matter if someone's telling you something horrible um, all online, that it's still the impact is going to be the same. Um, and I think people get bold because they think that that's not going to happen, right? People think that if I type it, right? If I don't have to look this person in the face and say this to them, that it's not going to impact them as much because it doesn't impact me to say it because I'm safe. Um, right. But I don't think that's the case. And that's where I think the ugly side of social media comes from, where we can posture and we can, we can put a facade of ourselves um, in ways that other people who are looking at us believe is true, right? Like I think people need a better education, not a better education. I just think over time, people will start to realize more that what is represented on social media isn't always true. Right. Um, but that's true of people in life, right? Like you can meet somebody and think that they have their life together, they've got everything together, that they're, um, you know, that they're very wealthy, that they have a great job. And then in reality, their life is a mess, right? So I think all of the things about language and life that are beautiful and terrible are just exacerbated by social media. Um, right. And I do think that like some of it needs to be regulated, right? I do think that like if you are saying dangerous, violent things online, that in real life, if you were saying that you would be prosecuted for, that you should be able to be prosecuted for it because of social on social media, right? Right, right. Um, so, I mean, as somebody who loves language, the good and the bad of it, um, I just think it's complex. I think social media is a really complicated piece of who we are at this point. It's an extension of ourselves, right? So people, you know, people don't realize that like your phone is AI, right? Like it's like, right. it's an extension, it's like assistive technology. Um, we use it as an extension of ourselves, but I think maybe we're just not, we, we need a little more training and, and how to properly right. use it as an extension of ourselves. Right, now you have a popular TikTok channel, which I think is pretty much the extent of your social media. I, I yeah. might be wrong, but you can tell, you can tell the no, listeners that it is. A little, um, so on your TikTok channel, sometimes it appears that maybe you're addressing a comment that was made. You might be you, like a rebuttal to something someone said. Right. I'm not sure exactly, but I'm curious, like what type of comments do you get? Do you get a lot of people that just kind of you troll your account and say something obscene or do you get, you know, do, do you get people that are really interested in linguistics that are offering compliments or they're, they're saying they're they're disputing what you're saying what kind of stuff do you get do you get a, I get all a of well, that. you get all of, get all of that yeah and I think um you know if you're somebody like me who's very sensitive and very um self-conscious most of the time um just like in life if you hear a million compliments and then one person says something negative that one thing is just going to become like a giant in your in your face and you're just going to think about it all day the same thing happens with the comments that i get online i get so many and i am like you i do not have what i would consider a large following but the five thousand people that i do have i am so blown away by like how interested people are in the things that i'm putting out because i started it to give it to my students to give those videos to my students um so i am so grateful for the people that come to me and say, thank you so much. I learned more in 60 seconds on this than I learned in eight years of PD. That is everything that I wanted my channel to be. But then you do have people who are very critical and very flippantly hurtful, not realizing what they're saying, right? Because language is not neutral. Um, so I get those a lot. And that tends to be hard for me to kind of get over. You know, it's hard, it's, it's hard to, for, to get over. Um, right. Uh, but I respond to as many comments as I can, especially when people are rude to me, um, not to be rude to them back, but just to let you know, I'm a human being that you just said that to, right? Like to make you aware of, I'm not, you didn't just put that out into the world and no one's going to see it. Like I'm a human person <laughs> with emotion. Um, and I think that's something that because I'm not on social media, most of the time has been a little bit of a challenge for me. I think other creators that are kind of have been in the, been vulnerable and visible like that probably take on the chin a little bit better than I do. Um, but it's something that I'm learning to deal with. Uh, but again, like I think that people should be held accountable for the things they say. So if you write something about, you know, challenging the fact that, you know, telling me that you think I'm stupid, I'm not going to just let you say that, right? Like I've worked very hard to not be stupid. <laughs> for right, right. You know, right. I think those things get to me a little bit more when people, um, 
you know, speak down to me or um, diminish my accomplishments, that kind of stuff gets to me a little bit more than, you know, if a 15 year old is telling me that I'm ugly, whatever, um, <laughs> you know, so I think that it's been something that I, it's a journey that I'm learning to how, how to cope with. But I do respond to people because I think you need to be held accountable for the things you say. Um, I yeah. think that people shouldn't just get away, especially because as creators, people don't realize how hard it is to like put yourself out there and be so vis visible and so vulnerable. And for someone to so flippantly just cut you down and think that that's fine because it's the internet, I'm just not cool with that. So I always have to, I have to clap back a little bit. <laughs> Yeah. It's interesting. Like uh, I put a book out last year and generally the reviews are good, but mm -hmm. I don't usually read reviews because I put out the book I wanted to put out. Right. <laughs> like, I wasn't, right. like it wasn't like I was making a Hollywood movie where I had to make this movie for the public and whatever music was in it or, you know, whatever, whoever was cast in it. It's outside of my control. There's groups that figure out who's popular and what's popular and you make it and you deliver it to, to the world just like a DJ has to play music that they don't necessarily want to hear, but they right. put it out for the public. I wrote a book I wanted to read. <laughs> and right. I, if it sold six copies, that was great. But if it sold 10,000, that's even better. But I don't you read the reviews, but, but in social media, I kind of have to respond because it's really right. me. It's really me there, you know, right. and they're saying something to me and I'm like a rude asshole if I don't respond. And right. uh, so I kind of feel like even though they might say something off color or put my book down or whatever, I'm kind of have to address it because social media is might as well just be Todd media because that's what I'm doing out there. Right, right, and, right. Uh, it's, um, it's such a piece of yourself that you're offering to people in a very public way. Um, you know, in academia, I've been critiqued all the time by people who are in my field, by my advisors, by other academics. Um, but it's different on social media in that you can't really regulate who's seeing it. So it's almost like more of a challenge that way because you have to make it consumable for people that are not n are not in your field. Um, but you also have to deal with the evaluation of people who might not be on the same page as you. Um, and sometimes it can be really cruel the way that people speak to you. Um, and so sometimes I want to like give them lessons on how to, you know, just be a nice person. <laughs> right. um, or how to, right. you know, how to say something to somebody, right? So there's a way to critique things that you don't like without being cruel. Um, yeah. And I think that that is something that is not, that is very prevalent on TikTok is people don't know how to critique something without being cruel. And I think sometimes the cruelty is the point. Um, right. Sometimes people get a high over being cruel and knowing that they have, they can't be held accountable for it because they are a faceless n number on TikTok. Yeah. Um, but you know, I'm going to clap back. That's my, that's my thing is that if you think that because I'm, I'm a young female that I'm not going to come for you or be assertive or direct, you've got, you've got the wrong lady. <laughs> <laughs> well, Julianne, it's been a pleasure having you on the podcast today. It was, this Thank was you. a lot of fun. We really covered a lot of really neat stuff. Um, I hope you come back. I, there's yeah, more I, I want to get into with language. There's so much yeah. more I want to cover. But right now, I just needed to kind of give my listeners a crash course into this world because I'm sure, I'm certain that people are going to think about language in a different way after listening to this and the complexities of it and not take it for granted as much as they have been. And, and hopefully uh, uh, you really realize some of the stuff that we've talked about today. So tell everyone how they can find you out there on the interwebs. You're, you're just TikTok. Is that right? Or are, are you? Other it really is just TikTok. Um, mm -hmm. So my, because my Instagram is mostly my pictures of my dog. Um, mm -hmm. the, my TikTok is Julianne underscore underscore B. And my name is spelled J-U-L-I-A-N-E underscore underscore lowercase B. And that is my TikTok handle. And that is really the only social media I have at this point, unless you want to look at pictures of my dog. And I believe that my Instagram name is just Julianne Bolata, which is my full name. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, good. Well, good. So yeah. So everyone go look for her on TikTok because I love you put up like almost like multiple videos a day. It seems like. I try to. Yeah. Yeah. So, so they're a lot of fun to watch and I think people will learn a lot, but uh, thanks for coming out and, uh, and let's, let's plan to talk again soon. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Take care. You have a good day.
there you have it. My interview with Julianne Bellata. Hope you enjoyed it. A lot of great information in this podcast. So much that I didn't know about language, the history of it, and the uses of it. I hope she comes back. There's still so many things I want to know about this topic. Hope you enjoyed it. We'll see you next week. Bye-bye. Thank you for listening to Quest. Please be sure and rate and review this podcast. This podcast is copyright. Any previously trademarked or copyright content is used by permission. Be sure to visit the official website for the International Association of Metatomics at metatomics.org or find us on social media for other unique content. And make sure to pick up a copy of the book that started a spiritual revolution, Metatomics, The Grand Design, available for sale online and at most major bookstores. Thanks for listening.